Hello, true crimeers. Long time no see, huh? It's been a, like, what, like five minutes since I last posted a video? <laughs> I'm so sorry to bombard you with so many videos. I'm just, I don't want to lose all of those TikTok videos. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm, I think, I, I don't, I don't know what I think. <laughs> So this is going to be the last uh, like super long compilation video of like over an hour long. Um, from now on, when I do more of these compilations, which will be like a week or so from now, um, I'll try to make them a little bit shorter. Uh, but what I have already started to do is I've gone through a lot of my recent compilations and I've done the chapters. Um, so that way you can easily uh, find a particular story. If you left off at a certain point, you can go right back into it by clicking on the uh, chapter. Uh, so I'm going to start doing that with every compilation. It might take me a while to go through all the older ones, but the past like five or six I've done it on. So yay. So starting tomorrow, uh, Sunday, the 15th of January, 2023, if you're in the future, hi, how are you? Uh, that'll be starting my official posting schedule. <laughs> Uh, so Sunday and Wednesday, long form true crime videos, and then Monday and Tuesday, short form true crime videos under like five to 10 minutes long. Um, Thursday, Friday, I don't post anything. Um, and then Saturday nights, uh, starting this coming Saturday, uh, I will be doing a two hour live stream. So I'll usually schedule them out so you guys can like see that it's planned. Uh, real quick, while I have you, go ahead and give my uh, my Twitter and my Facebook page follows as well, just so I'm kind of everywhere, because you, you, know, you never know. Um, so those can be found in the link tree, which is in the description below. So this is going to be 20 more stories where I think the theme of this one was uh, the culprit was typically a man. Uh, aren't, aren't, aren't they all? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so without further ado, here you go. Please give me a like, a comment. I think those help with the algorithm. I don't know. Um, and a subscribe if you're new. So, all right. Without further ado, here we go. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> This is a case that involved a carjacking, and then a failed carjacking, a failed robbery attempt. This one is a wild mess. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Matt Landry. Viewer discretion is advised. Matt was a 21-year-old aspiring musician who lived just outside of Detroit, Michigan. He was a pizza delivery driver, he was the drummer um, of a like garage rock band. And despite the, you know, the rocker mentality, Matt was described as someone who had like the softest heart and a heart of gold. He was dating uh, Francesca Bomarito. And one August night of 2009, Francesca was feeling very sick. And Matt, he wanted to do anything he could do to make his girlfriend feel better. He made her a nice cup of tea. He drew her a hot bath. He brought a thermometer to her so she can check her temperature. And then he asked her if he could go get her some food, um, which she said, no, that's okay. So instead, Matt let her take a nap and then he went out to go do some errands. But then Matt never got home from those errands. He never got back to his girlfriend. He never went back to his house where he lived with his parents. He was just suddenly gone. He wasn't answering his phone or text messages. This is something that's very much unlike Matt. He has never just sort of gotten up and took off. So they kind of thought, well, maybe he got into an accident and he's in a hospital. So friends and family were calling local hospitals and like urgent care centers to see if maybe anyone just like Matt had been there, but it was a no-go. They found nothing. It's now been a couple of days and he still hasn't shown up anywhere. So they obviously report him missing at this point. Matt's mom would go and check his bank records and she noticed something very concerning. There were three consecutive $100 withdrawals all done on the same day. And it was in an area of town that Sam had never gone to. 
I guess it was an area that was just like littered with crime and houses that were disheveled and burnt down, cars without tires, like it was just a really bad stretch of neighborhood. Now, around the same time or day that he had gone missing, um, a woman had walked into the Flagstar Bank. She felt like some guy was watching her from the parking lot because she noticed him. But she walked in. It was the middle of the day, of course, so nothing could really happen, right? Well, the moment she went up to the teller window, a man, the same guy who was watching her, came up right behind her and put a gun to the back of her head. And he demanded $50,000 from the teller. So the teller would give him like a very small amount of money because it's all she had. Um, so he did not get the 50K he wanted. And then he was trying to force the young woman to leave the bank with him at gunpoint. But the 19 year old woman, Sarah Maynard, she did something I don't think I've ever heard before. Um, and it's pretty risky, but it was pretty badass. She just literally popped a squat. She sat down right there on the floor and said, nope, I'm not going with you. And that really like fucked with his brain because he's like, God, f yeah. and then he is captured on camera leaving the bank without her and with just a tiny amount of money. Now, around this bank issue, sometime later that day, um, someone would be caught on CCTV footage taking money out of an ATM using Matt Landry's card. This would be one of those $100 transactions. Well, who is it? Oh, hello, it's our friend from the bank. Meanwhile, Matt's family and his girlfriend are searching dumpsters for his body. They are still calling hospitals to see if maybe he is there somehow. No luck. So like a day or so later on August 11th, 2009, um, a man who was parked at a Walmart, um, he was accosted by another man holding a gun. The man was attempting to carjack this guy's car. And he succeeded until he got inside the car and realized it was a stick shift. The uh, carjacker didn't know how to drive a stick shift. So he's like, Gah! and then he, uh, he ran away. But while he was running away, a police officer was there and managed to capture him. <laughs> it's this guy, the guy in the white shirt from the bank and from, you know. It was a teenager named Ihab Masomani, whose street name was Ihop. About that same day, police discover Matt Landry's vehicle, and there isn't really much evidence inside. There is a map with a uh, couple X's on locations, which just so happened to be the bank that that one man tried to rob, who also matches a description of the guy using Matt Landry's ATM card. This may be our guy, but where's Matt? Well, police would discover that on the day that Matt disappeared, there was a 911 call made from a Quiznos sub. Quiznos sub just so happens to be the very last place that Matt used his debit card that they can confirm was him using it. I guess someone inside the Quiznos saw what would later be found out is Matt trying to get into his car, but he was then accosted by a stranger. The stranger grabbed Matt by the throat and threw him in his own trunk and then the man stole the vehicle. The carjacking was reported, but I guess it wasn't linked to Matt right away. I'm not sure why or how that happened. Eesh, this is a long video. This probably should have been a YouTube video, sorry. <laughs> At any rate, on August 13th, 2009, the search for Matt Landry would be over. In this neighborhood, which was in an area called Seven Mile, which is that stretch of area where the ATM withdrawals were done, in one of the many burnt out houses in that area, police would find a body. And they would later confirm that it was the decomposed body of 21 year old Matt Landry. He had been killed by a single gunshot wound to his head. And all of this would be linked directly to this man, IHOP, as he's called. But it turns out for the kidnapping and carjacking of Matt Landry, he had help. A 16-year-old kid named Robert Fat Daddy Taylor. Both men would go to trial for the murder, carjacking, and kidnapping of Matt Landry. And they were both convicted. And they were sentenced to life in prison without parole. Later, there would be a, an attempt and an appeal to say that they should have gotten lighter sentences because they were minors at the time. And... Oh, those poor guys, they murdered someone, but they're young. Let's just, you know, 
give him another shot at life. No. And thankfully, the courts actually said, no, no, they were life in prison without parole. And that's what we're sticking with. They would even try going to the Supreme Court at some point, but they were denied, denied, denied. So justice was served properly in this case, thankfully. Here on the grounds of this abandoned academy in North Carolina, the murdered body of a teenage girl would be discovered. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kathleen Smiley. Viewer discretion is advised. There's not really a ton of information, unfortunately, about her, um, but at the time of this case, she was a 16-year-old girl who lived in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with her family. On the morning of April 21st, 1974, Kathleen would get into her Volkswagen bug with her 12-year-old sister, Patricia, and they would head about five miles away from their home to meet their father for breakfast at Denny's. When breakfast was over, her father and Patricia would go to the nearby Lake Lanier to go swimming. Kathleen wanted to drive back home real quick, get her swimsuit, pick up her boyfriend, and then go meet her father and sister. At some point, her Volkswagen ran out of gas, so she was stranded. Well, lo and behold, two men approached her and offered to go pick her up some gas from a nearby gas station. The clerk at a nearby Shell station said that two men would walk up to him, purchase $5 worth of gas, and bring it to a young woman uh, who was standing outside of her car. At some point, the young woman went to the gas station. She made a phone call to her mom real quick to explain what was going on, and then that was it. The gas station clerk then saw the woman get into the driver's seat of the vehicle and the two other men get in the car as well. The very next day, Kathleen's body was found tied to a pine tree right outside of an abandoned academy called Lincoln Academy, and this was in North Carolina. She had been stabbed seven times. They determined that none of the stab wounds would have killed her immediately, so this was a form of torture, and she was gagged with a men's t-shirt. Based on the description that the gas station attendant gave, it did not take police long to figure out who these two men were. The two of them were escaped convicts, Pinckney Thomas Mitchell and Wallace Charles Lanford. Well, the day after the body was found, the two men had gone back to that spot and planted her Volkswagen bug and set it on fire where it exploded. The two men had bragged about what they did to Kathleen to their friends. They admitted to sexually assaulting her and then they tortured her by stabbing her slowly seven different times and then gagged her. She was still alive when they walked away from her so she slowly bled to death. And it actually wouldn't take long to catch them because they were found. The friends would later tell police what they were told based on witness statements from the gas station attendants and other people. Both men were found guilty in her murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. She was asleep on the couch when they last saw her, but when her friends woke up, she was gone. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brianna Dennison, Viewer discretion is advised. Brianna was born on March 29th. Hey, that's my birthday too, 1988. She grew up in Reno, Nevada, which is where she graduated high school. And then she would end up going to Santa Barbara College in California. She was actually going there and studying psychology. In January of 2008, she would vacation back home to Nevada so she could see some friends and family. Brianna and her friends were hanging out on the night of January 20th, 2008, and they were just kind of going to certain events, and then eventually they would go back to one of their apartments. That evening, Brianna had fallen asleep on her friend's couch, and then the next morning, her friend woke up around 9 o'clock, and when she went out there, Brianna was not in the living room. Shown later at the trial, this blood stain was on the pillow that Brianna was laying on. They called police immediately, and they determined that Brianna, well, she had been kidnapped. But by who? Police would process the scene, and they would collect male DNA, which was unknown at the time, from the front door's doorknob. Then other stories had come out that in November and December previous, uh, two women on campus there in Nevada, the University of Nevada, 
well, they had been sexually assaulted by a man, and they were able to give this description of that man. So police circulated this image, but the DNA came back to no one in their system. The community would be out searching for Brianna, but they were having no luck for several days. They had searched in a 100 square mile area. And on February 15th, 2008, a man was walking back to work from lunch when he saw two orange socks. Then he called police and they found Brianna's body. Brianna had been sexually assaulted and was murdered. On November 25th, 2008, this man, 27-year-old James Biella, was arrested and charged with her murder. Well, how did police get there? Well, an anonymous tip came in that his girlfriend told a friend that she found other women's underwear inside of his truck, several pairs. And bearing his very strong resemblance to the composite drawing, the girlfriend told the friend and then the friend called anonymously. When he was arrested, they were able to collect his DNA and it in fact matched that of, from the crime scene. It also matched other sexual assaults. He would go on trial and get convicted and he was sentenced to death. And no, he did not know Brianna. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lena Wrighthouse. Viewer discretion is advised. Lena was born on May 18th, 1981, and she lived with her family in Lexington, Indiana. In 1996, she was 14 years old and was in high school. She loved to play basketball, and she loved just sort of like athletics in general, and she wanted to become a physical therapist uh, when she was older. Lena was described as a very, um, I guess, open, very bubbly, just very, you know, outspoken young girl, but everybody loved her. She would always play with all of the kids in the neighborhood. She never didn't let a kid play with their group. She wanted to make sure everyone was welcomed. She was very mature for a 14 year old. On January 15th, 1996, Lena was home alone while her parents were at work and her sister was, I believe at school. Later that day, the family would come home and they would find Lena in a pool of blood. She had been stabbed between 16 to 18 times. Police were obviously called and eventually the coroner would determine that she had been sexually assaulted as well. And that was likely the motive of this crime. It didn't take police long to find out who it was. This was 19-year-old Jeremy Jones. He actually lived across the street from Lena Wrighthouse and her family. He had been observed with just cuts and scratches all over him, and people had seen him with blood. He was a very odd guy, and with all the cuts and blood, people just put two and two together, and Jeremy would be arrested for this crime. This was just a case where he knew or found out that Lena was home alone, and he took up that opportunity to become the monster that was probably living inside of him. He would be arrested, he would go to trial, he would be convicted, and he would initially be sentenced to 60 years in prison. But then for some reason where I can't exactly find why, that was then reduced to 30 years. Then they took four more years off his sentence because he received a bachelor's degree while in prison. What? He sexually assaulted and murdered a 14-year-old girl. You're going to reward him by letting him go free four years sooner because he got a bachelor's degree? But at any rate, he was actually released in January of 2022. Lena's family has a restraining order against him, of course, and they and the community just do not feel safe. I understand why. A Halloween party would end in a sudden murder. But why? Hello, <laughs> true crimeers. Uh, this is the case of Carrie Heath. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a normal day here on Buffalo Springs Drive in Fort Worth, Texas. 35-year-old middle school teacher Carrie Heath had finished his day at school. 
Carey was also a member of the Texas Air National Guard, and he was an Air Force veteran. Everything seemed normal with him. He was known as a really sweet guy. Um, neighbors would describe him as like a family man who was always out playing with his kids. They never noticed anything wrong or unusual with him, which is what makes this so bizarre. Picture here were best friends Daniel Ferros and Philip Evans. Two guys who were in their 20s, they actually worked the same job, they worked the same shift, and they even lived together with one of their uh, families. Most people describe the two of them as brothers. Both were described as just really fun-loving guys who just love to entertain people and make others laugh. And they were always so friendly to, like, everyone. On the night of October 23rd, 2016, the best friends were out having some fun, going from bar to bar, just having some drinks with some friends. And then they got back to the home they were living in on Buffalo Springs Drive. When they got there, they noticed that one of the neighbors was having a small little Halloween party that everyone was invited to go to. So the two friends went over there and hung out on the front lawn for a bit, kind of as the party was wrapping up. They were even having really fun, cordial conversations with Carrie Heath and his wife, Tiffany, there at the party. Then the two friends decided to walk back to their house. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. All of a sudden, Carrie Heath runs into his garage because his house is just, you know, a couple houses down. He grabs something and then around 3 a.m. you suddenly hear gunshots. He had taken an assault rifle and shot Daniel and Philip just outside their house. And then he took the gun and he started to bash them over the head. It was overkill and they were both brutally murdered. Carrie then ran back to his house. He had his wife hide things. He admitted to his wife, I just killed two people. So the two of them were suddenly cleaning up evidence, hiding things, but enough people witnessed this happen. The very next day, he was arrested at his school and he was charged with a double homicide. But why did he do it? Nobody knows. No one has ever said why he did it. He got sentenced to life in prison without parole. But what the fuck? Why? I swear to God, it is cases like this that, oh man, the human race, it, uh, it, 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 it sucks. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Abigail Abby Smith. Viewer discretion is advised. Abby was an 11-year-old girl who lived in the Keensburg, New Jersey area. She actually lived here in this apartment building with her family. Abby's favorite color was purple. She loved going to the nearby park to play with her friends. She was described by everyone as someone who is just such a joyful person to be around and brought so much happiness to everyone. Her brother would describe Abby as someone who was just so very different, um, but in a completely good way. He said there was just no one on earth like Abby. Unfortunately, Abby would be stolen from her friends and family in 2017. On the evening of July 12th, 2017, Abby was supposed to be back at her apartment, but by about 9 p.m., she never walked inside. She was just out, you know, playing with friends, or so people thought, but her friends said they hadn't seen her. So they contacted police, and a search began. It would not be very long until they found out where she was. They were searching behind one of the uh, tenants' apartments there, and they noticed something was wrapped up in like a sheet and it was just sitting on a roof like overhang. When police went to examine it inside was the body of Abby Smith. The 11 year old girl was stabbed to death and she was sexually assaulted. It didn't take police very long to find out who was responsible. The body must have come from one person's apartment this man, Andreas Arazo. A quick search of his room would show there was a blood-stained mattress, there was blood on other sheets. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. His motive was sexual. What a creep. 
He would end up pleading guilty to all charges and he was sentenced to 63 years to life. And in court, uh, Abby's mother would scream at him, calling him a monster and saying she hopes he rots in hell. I second that. To those of you who are fans of JCS, you may be very familiar with this image. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Russell Williams. Viewer discretion is advised. Russell Williams joined the Canadian forces in 1987. He would go on to have a 23-year career. By July of 2009, he became a commanding officer. He would not be in that role very long. Beginning sometime in 2007, many houses in Russell Williams' neighborhood were being broken into. Some of the homeowners were not even aware their homes were broken into until many years later, um, but a lot of people were aware um, as there were like slashed screens, broken windows. Now it wouldn't come out until later, but some of the most common items stolen from these homes was underwear, ladies underwear, some even from children. And then in September of 2009, whoever was doing all these break-ins got a little more bold. The assailant would then blindfold the female residences of those homes and he sexually assaulted a couple of them and then he forced them to take photographs in the nude. And then it got worse. This was Corporal Marie-France Comau. She actually was under Russell Williams' command in Trenton. You see, someone had broken in through her basement, and this is a photo taken from that night, and apparently they weren't aware that Marie was home. So a struggle would ensue, and she would end up getting tied up and have duct tape put around her mouth. She was sexually assaulted, and then she would eventually die of asphyxiation because of the duct tape. The assailant then just left her body in her bedroom, wrapped up in a blanket. On January 29th, 2010, Jessica Lloyd would go missing from her home. She would be reported missing the next day. So back there is uh, Jessica Lloyd's house. Also near her house, they found tire tracks and two different sets of boot prints, one which belonged to Jessica Lloyd and one to an unknown person at the time. Police would run the tire treads through the system and would uncover that those tires likely belonged to a Pathfinder. So police would then set up a checkpoint, basically under the guise of, uh, you know, checking for drunk drivers. But the reality is, is they were looking at everyone's vehicles to see if the tire treads matched the ones near Jessica Lloyd's house. Well, Russell Williams had driven through one of these checkpoints. Russell, pictured here with his then wife, he made up a lie that said, oh, I gotta get home really fast. I can't do this checkpoint right now, guys. I have a sick kid at home. That was a lie. But as he was leaving, police noticed the tire treads and they noticed they were an exact match of the ones near Jessica Lloyd's home. So he went on their radar. This is when he was brought into the police station um, because of the tire tracks matching. They would also confiscate all of his shoes and boots. His exact boot impressions were the exact ones left behind at Jessica Lloyd's. They had Russell Williams dead to rights. This police interrogator does one of the best jobs you will see in an interrogation. And this whole thing is wonderfully analyzed by JCS. I'm not sure if this one's on his YouTube, it may just be on his Patreon, but he was confronted with the evidence and the police officer asked, where's Jessica Lloyd? Because she still wasn't found. And he just said, do you have a map? Now they also looked through his home and they took all sorts of evidence, including cameras. I am not going to risk showing any of those photos, but there were a shit ton of photos. He took photos of virtually every home he broke into. He was the person breaking into all of the homes. He took photos of himself in that house with wearing the women's lingerie, their bras, their underwear. He also stole like hundreds of pairs of underwear, all of which he photographed and police were able to find. 
They found lock picking devices. They found more uh, secret photos on a computer that was hidden in his basement. He was a decorated member of the Canadian forces. This information, when it came out with all of the, the thefts, the underwear, him dressing in the underwear, taking pictures, this, it, it, and of course the murders, all came as a, a horrible, like crazy shock to everyone. He would lead police to where Jessica Lloyd's body was. He had buried her body about 15 minutes away from where she lived. You know, Russell's wife would later go on to say that she always had feelings about something like this. She just couldn't quite put her finger on it, but something was off with him. And ultimately, she would be one of his victims. I mean, she was conned this entire time. Russell Williams would be convicted of first-degree murder, sexual assault, forcible confinement, and breaking and entering. And he was sentenced to life in prison. And yes, he was dishonorably discharged, essentially, and any award he received was revoked. How many of you actually knew that Jeffrey Dahmer was murdered in prison alongside another convicted murderer? Honestly, I did not know. Let's talk about these two folks. So this was salesman Jesse Anderson, who was born in Illinois, but then eventually would move to Wisconsin. Later down the road, Jesse would eventually marry Barbara, and they had three children together. Well, apparently by 1992, the marriage wasn't going so well. Jesse thought the marriage was failing, so he wanted to give it one more shot, right? On the night of April 21st, 1992, he took his wife out to go see a movie, and then afterwards they went to go have dinner, and at that point he planned to try to reconcile their marriage. Apparently it didn't go well. After they left the TGI Fridays that they were eating at in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they would walk to their car, and not too soon afterward, police were called because there were two people on the ground bleeding. It was Jesse Anderson and his wife, Barbara. They had both apparently been stabbed. Barbara immediately went into a coma and would eventually die a couple days later, but Jesse, who had four stab wounds to his chest, would survive. Most of his stab wounds were superficial. Barbara was stabbed 21 times in the face. Jesse said that the assailants were two black men. He said he managed to knock off one of their hats, a Los Angeles Clippers hat. So police were looking for two black men who have done this. Well, in their investigation, it turns out that it wasn't two black men. It was Jesse Anderson who stabbed his wife multiple times in the face. By using forensic smarts and also witness testimony, that's how they came to that conclusion. Jesse had bought the hat from this man that same day. Jesse was convicted and sentenced to 60 years to life. He would eventually end up in the same prison as Jeffrey Dahmer. And also, Christopher Scarver. Christopher was working in Milwaukee at a Conservation Corps job group. He was promised a full-time position at this job by a man who eventually that man would be terminated from the company. Therefore, Scarver's promotion to full-time never got to happen. So on June 1st, 1990, he went to his place of work and he confronted the person who replaced the man who promised him a full-time job. That man was named Steve Lohman and he was demanding money from him. And he was pointing a gun at Steve Lohman. He was drunk, he was crazy. When Steve only gave him a few bucks, he shot him directly in the forehead, killing him instantly. And then shot him two more times after he was dead. Another person there would end up giving him a $3,000 check and he let them live. He found out that Jeffrey Dahmer was specifically targeting black young men. He also found out that Jesse Anderson tried to frame two black men for a murder he committed. So while on cleaning duty in a locker room at the prison, he beat both men to death with a metal bar. He's now serving three life sentences without parole. A two and a half year old child would be a front and center witness to a brutal murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rosalina Lobu. Viewer discretion is advised. Rosalina was born on May 18, 1969, and she lived in San Jose, California. 
She was described as a very shy person and also quite nerdy. She could talk to you all day though about movies and books and music. And all of her friends would say that she was the best friend a person could possibly have. When she was 18, she got a job here at this uh, photo store. This is a current uh, image of it. I actually cannot find any images of really anything from this case. But this was and still is a like a drive through uh, photo shop. On October 7th, 1987, the 18-year-old Rosalina was working there at the store. She got there around 2 p.m. and the store closes at 6 p.m. Yvonne Chapman was the full-time employee who worked there and she was supposed to be there from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But she left shortly after Rosalina got there to say that it was because her husband and her son had gotten into a car accident. This was a lie. Rosalina never got home that night. She was expected home. She did not say to anyone that she was going anywhere else. And then another person who worked at a different store there in the shopping center noticed that the door to the store was still open and the lights were on. But this was well after they were supposed to be closed. The person walked in cautiously and they uncovered a horrific scene. Rosalina was deceased on the ground and she appeared to have been stabbed many times. As a matter of fact, the coroner would determine she was stabbed 51 times. There was a few hundred dollars missing from the nearby safe, but her purse was still there and the money in her purse was also still there. Nothing else was stolen. It would take several years to uncover the truth. The woman who worked in the store with Rosalina, Yvonne, well, she was married to a man by the name of Eric Chapman. Apparently, Rosalina was telling Yvonne to leave Eric because he was an abusive boyfriend. So Eric, after Yvonne got home, after she lied about him being in a car accident, turns out she wanted to do drugs. He brought his two and a half year old son to the photo shop and he wanted to confront Rosalina. He alleges she pulled out a knife, but later on they would find out the knife was actually from his home. He placed his two and a half year old son on the ground and then he just viciously attacked and stabbed Rosalina. The young boy, Mario, was covered in her blood. Now, police would uncover that this was Eric because they did a lot of investigating and they followed, you know, certain paper trails and mainly they were looking into people who had worked at the photo shop. That's how they came across Yvonne, which led them to Eric and their history of uh, drug use and his history of abusing Yvonne really made them focus kind of on him. And then the two and a half year old boy, who, when they actually started to talk to them, he was closer to five years old at this point. He was able to recall everything that happened that night in horrific detail. He, even as a two and a half year old boy, remembered everything. He said daddy was stabbing her and she was still alive because he said he saw her breathing and she was like, <gasps> like gasping for air. And I guess Eric would later go on to say that at that point it was like thrilling for him. And he was like enjoying the, the torture aspect of this, which you're a monster for doing it to begin with. But in front of your child, in front of a nearly three year old boy, you're doing this. Her blood was caked all over him. The little boy said they had to burn my clothing because I had blood on me. Yvonne pretty much knew from the get-go that he killed Rosalina. The money that he stole from the safe, which he only did that to make it look like a robbery, they would go on to use within the first night or two after she was killed to buy cocaine because they both had an addiction to it. Now, Eric was, he was abused heavily by his own father. Later down the road, when Mario, his young boy, was born, he tried to bring Mario to introduce to his parents and his father. The moment he came in the house, his father went, grabbed a gun, pointed it at Eric, and told him to leave, even with his grandson right there. And then he never spoke to his father again. But Eric would use all of this as his reasoning for why he is the way he is. Great, now you're passing that down to your son, you know. Eric Chapman would get convicted of this murder and he was sentenced to death. 
But given that California has changed their death penalty, uh, you know, laws and whatnot, they, they are not really executing people so much anymore. But he is still awaiting his death sentence, which at this point appears will just be life without parole. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of James David Autry. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here is the little city of Port Arthur, which is in Texas. In the late evening hours of April 20th, 1980, James Autry and his roommate slash friend, whose name was John Sandifer, but I cannot find a photo of him, they would walk into a local convenience store and try to pick up a case of beer. Working the register that night was 43-year-old Shirley Drouet. Now, from what I can understand with the very minimal information about this case, is that some kind of dispute occurred over the case of beer, which would cause James Autry to take out his 38 caliber pistol, and he just put a bullet right between the eyes of Shirley Drouet, killing her instantly. There were two other people in the convenience store that night. Fortunately, I don't have photos of them. But one of them was a man by the name of Joe Broussard, and he also was shot directly in the head. He died instantly as well. And then another man by the name of Anthanasios Savarnis, I hope I pronounced that correctly, he managed to survive, but unfortunately he would have permanent brain damage. When police arrived after the shooting, nothing was stolen from the cash register. In fact, the only thing that was taken was the case of beer which back then only had a value of $2.70. Two people shot dead over a case of beer. Now, James Autry and his roommate were eventually caught, and both were convicted of the murders. I don't know the exact sentence of the roommate, but James Autry was sentenced to death. And in October of 1983, he was put on the lethal injection table, the needles were put inside of his arm, and then by some crazy last-minute miracle, he was spared. He received a stay of execution. This was due to some minor appeal based on a technicality, but eventually he would be sentenced to death again. On March 14, 1984, he was once again strapped to the table, and this time he was executed by lethal injection. Allegedly, it took 15 minutes for him to die after he was injected which this scenario would eventually be used later on for other lawyers to state that lethal injection is a, is a form of cruel and unusual punishment. James Autry actually fought to have his execution televised, but he lost. His final meal was a hamburger, french fries, and a Dr. Pepper. He had no final words, and apparently he died with a smirk on his face. A man claiming to be a 500-year-old vampire... Oh, for God's sakes, just... Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the vampire murders. Fewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was Richard Wendorf and Naoma Queen. And they lived in Eustis, Florida. And this was the daughter, Heather Wendorf. And this is the home they lived in. Now, from what I understand, Heather in high school met, um, well, uh, this guy, Rod Farrell. Uh. Eventually, he would move to Kentucky, where he would put together a band of gothy vampire f f f people. They were like a group of people who thought they were vampires. They called themselves the Vampire Clan. Uh, this was their base of operations. They called it the Vampire Hotel. They are very creative with, with names. Rod and Heather would still communicate through the phone. And apparently one day in 1996, Rod said, you know what? I'm going to come pick you up from Florida because she said that her parents were abusive. And this would be mentally and emotionally, not physically abusive. She was a teenager who just, you know, didn't like her parents. So Rod, along with some of his, oh, Jesus Christ, Scott Anderson, oh my God. Rod and Dana Cooper, Scott Anderson, and Charity Kesey, they would get in their car and they would drive to Florida to go pick up Heather and rescue her from her parents. When they eventually pulled up to the house after their very long drive to Florida, 
Heather would allegedly go out to the car to meet the two girls when Rod and Scott would enter the house and they claimed they were there to steal their car. But in the process, whether or not this was premeditated, it's not really known for sure. They would beat Richard over the head with a crowbar and then they would do the same thing to Naoma. They killed uh, Mr. Wendorf here on this couch while he was probably sleeping and Naoma was found on the kitchen floor. Each of them were hit dozens of times. Richard's older daughter, Jennifer, came home to discover their bodies. Everyone else had already fled the scene. Thanks to one of the girls who called their parents and let them know where they were, the four of them were arrested in Kentucky. Rod immediately claimed that he was a 500-year-old vampire, and his name was Visago, and he had been asleep for 500 years, and he was finally awoken. Also known as he was heavily into drugs for a lot of his young years. Rod here, I'm not Spider-Man kissing you, bud. He was convicted of the murders and he was sentenced to death, but then later that sentence was commuted to life in prison. Scott Anderson also got life in prison. The other two only got about 17 years. Heather was never charged with anything. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Rachel Hoffman. Viewer discretion is advised. Rachel was a 23-year-old Florida State graduate who was described as being vivacious, gregarious, and by 2008, she was just looking to move on to a new part of life. Back in 2007, she was pulled over just for a routine stop by a police officer, and she was caught with a very small amount of marijuana. About a year later, during a police search of her apartment, they discovered a lot more marijuana. They discovered ecstasy pills. So she was going to be charged with a lot. Police first asked her, hey, we'll reduce some of the charges if you can give us some names. Some of the names of like the bigger dealers out there. But Rachel was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Police were then able to basically pressure her into becoming an informant. They were going to have her wear a wire and see if she could, you know, purchase some drugs from some known dealers. Eventually, after again some pressure, she would agree and her charges would be lessened. On May 7th, 2008, Rachel would go to the Tallahassee Police Department where she would meet her uh, handler and his name was Ryan Pender. He gave her $13,000 in cash because they had already set up a drug deal. And the plan was for them to stay close behind Rachel and observe the entire thing as she was making this deal. The deal was to purchase some marijuana, cocaine, and a couple of guns. The plan was to meet the dealers at the Forest Meadows Park. And around 6.40 p.m. when she got to the area, Rachel did not turn into the parking lot that she agreed to go to. This is because the dealer saw her and said, hey, you know what, follow us this way, we wanna meet somewhere else. Investigator Pender, you know, heard this and said, no, 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 please don't do that. But she went anyway. And Investigator Pender, as well as his backup person, lost her. They didn't know where she went. They were not following close enough. Sometime between 7 p.m. and 7.30 p.m., Rachel was shot dead with a gun she was supposed to purchase by two dealers. I don't know if the wire she was wearing was operating at the time. I, I don't know. They would find Rachel's body in a ditch sometime later. Rachel was not given any training by the police department in terms of how to be an informant. The two dealers she was supposed to meet with, she had never met them before, so they were strangers. She knew nothing about guns. They just threw her into a situation she had no business being in, and she was killed for it. Eventually, police apprehended the two people who killed her. They would be convicted and sentenced to 30 years to life. Rachel's handler was fired, but then he was eventually reinstated. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Brittany Harrop and Ashley Key. Viewer discretion is advised. Brittany was a 19-year-old college student and a mother of two young girls. She lived in Edgerton, Missouri. She was described as someone who had a true natural gift of motherhood and had a zest for life. Ashley Key was a 22-year-old mother of one. She was described as a perfect mother with a smile always on her face 
and someone who just always had a ton of love to give. On the evening of Friday, July 13th, 2012, Brittany Harrop's fiance would come home to discover that Brittany and Ashley were both gone. However, the children were still in the home and safe. He did notice there was a blood trail leading outside, so the two young women were reported missing right away. The search began that night and would go into the following afternoon. The following afternoon after they were reported missing, police would discover Brittany's truck. They found it down a road in a neighborhood, but Brittany and Ashley were still nowhere to be found. Once police released images of the truck, witnesses would come forward to say they think they saw a man that they knew driving the truck. That man was 31-year-old Clifford Miller. Ten years ago today, on July 16th, 2012, police would go to his girlfriend's home where he was. He would then be arrested and charged with the suspicion of at least kidnapping the two young women. He would end up confessing to much more. Clifford Miller would say that on that evening he had smoked a lot of meth. And he got this wild idea in his mind that, I want to go have sexual intercourse now with Brittany Harrop. They never had a relationship prior to this. And how exactly they knew each other, I'm not positive. When he got to the home, he just walked in, the door was unlocked, and he saw Ashley Key sleeping on the couch. Ashley had woken up and confronted him, so he then beat her over the head and then suffocated her until she was dead. He then stated that it was no longer the intention to have sex with Brittany. Instead, he intended to now kill her. He would then go into the room where she was sleeping next to her daughter. He then took the daughter out and put her in another room, went back to Brittany's room, and clubbed her over the head with some form of wooden stick or object until she was dead. It is unclear if he sexually assaulted her still or not. He then loaded both of their bodies into Brittany's truck and dumped their bodies in a field in this area. He would take police to their bodies where they were discovered. He was then charged with two counts of murder where he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A Louisiana sheriff's deputy would lose his fucking mind one day. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Chad Lavier. Viewer discretion is advised. Apologies up front, this case got virtually no coverage, so I cannot find photos of anything. The morning of October 17th, 1996, near Halma, Louisiana, was a relatively normal morning until 8.30 a.m. when a Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Department deputy pulled over a random woman. There was no reason for the traffic stop, not a legal one at least. Out of absolutely nowhere, the sheriff's deputy takes out his mace and maces the driver. He then handcuffed her and dragged her away from her car. He then put her in his vehicle, drove her to a field where he sexually assaulted her. He took photos of her private parts. When he was finished with her, he then drove her back to her vehicle and gave her two options. One, you can go about your day like nothing happened. Or two, you can report me to the police in which I will kill you and your family. He gave her his name. His name was Chad Lavier. The victim went to police, but it would be too late anyway. Chad got back into his deputy's vehicle. He then drove to a nearby bank called the Argent Bank, where his ex-wife was a teller. At about 10.30 a.m., he walks inside armed with an AR-15. There were two male customers in there, which he forced out of the building at gunpoint. They then went to police. Everyone remaining in the building were female. He then grabbed all of the females and put them in one little sitting area. No, this is not an image of that. With all of the women terrified, he then takes his AR-15, kind of just begins moving it around, and for no reason whatsoever, he shoots one of them square in the forehead, killing her instantly. Her name was Pamela Duplantis. She had a nine-year-old girl at home. By this time, there were negotiators outside where he would agree to release one of the hostages in exchange for lunch, which did happen. And then he took one of the women to the back of the bank and forced her to give him mouth stuff. 
He then sexually assaulted her. He then attempted to sexually assault his ex-wife, but for some reason he wasn't able to do it. He was able to sexually assault another one of the female tellers, however. 30 hours later, after a standoff, Chad Lavier would finally surrender and release the rest of the hostages. He was then arrested and went through a trial where he was convicted and sentenced to death. However, later his death sentence would be overturned and he would instead be sentenced to life in prison without parole. This is a murder case that sounds like it came straight out of a movie. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael Halberstam. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael and his wife Elliot lived here in this home, which was located in Washington, D.C. He was born in August of 1932 in the Bronx, New York. He would later go on to the Boston University School of Medicine, where he became an M.D., and then he became a really well-respected cardiologist. He and his wife were doing really well for themselves, and they were just living the life. On the evening of December 5th, 1980, he and his wife went out to dinner, and then they got home to their house in D.C., and they realized they weren't alone. Someone was in their house. Someone was rummaging through their things. It was this man, Bernard Welch Jr. He was considered a very prolific uh, thief, well-known in the thievery world. He was also an escaped convict. He had recently broke out of prison. He was clearly not expecting them to be there, and he had himself a revolver, and he fired two shots into the chest of Michael Halberstam. Bernard then got into his vehicle and began to speed away. But Michael? He was still alive. He and his wife got into their vehicle where he was driving, even though he had two bullets in his chest, and he sped after their assailant. And, believe it or not, Michael found him. He said, that's the guy. So Michael crashed his vehicle into Bernard's car. It spun Bernard's vehicle around, but he was relatively unharmed. Michael would then swerve and he crashed into a tree. His wife was fine, but then Michael was rushed to the hospital, where just a couple of hours after he was shot, he would die. Now, Bernard was injured enough where he really couldn't go anywhere, so police were able to arrest him. He was charged with felony murder and also second-degree armed burglary, plus four counts of grand larceny. He got convicted on all charges, and he was sentenced to 143 years in prison. Michael's well-respected legacy has lived on, and his wife was able to sue Bernard Welch. And she won. She actually got $5.7 million. Good for her. Bernard Welch died in prison in 1997. Police would respond to a house on fire in Orlando, Florida, and inside, a nightmare. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kathy Sue Weaver. Viewer discretion is advised. Kathy, who would actually go by her middle name, Sue, she was born on May 16th, 1949. By 1994, she had founded her own company, which was an embroidery company. Sue was absolutely passionate about what she did. Now, when she founded her company, she actually had moved to Orlando, Florida to do so. She wanted a, a new beginning in life. She bought this house right here, and she lived alone there. On the afternoon of August 27, 2001, Sue's neighbors would call police to report that Sue's house was on fire. Police and firefighters arrived very quickly and they were able to put out the fire, which seemed to be centered specifically in her bedroom. But there was some, you know, minor damage outside of the room as well, but they could tell that the fire was started in the room. And lying on the bed in the room were the charred remains of Sue Weaver. She was 52 years old. Kathy had no clothing on. She had the comforter draped over her. Her hands and her ankles were tied up, and they also placed a towel directly over her face. The autopsy would reveal that she had been bludgeoned to death as her skull was fractured. 
Police began to wonder what the motive was because nothing was taken from her home. As a matter of fact, her purse with money inside was still found right next to her bed. The front door, the back door, nothing was kicked in, so there was no forced entry. So they believe that Sue let her assailant in. So she likely knew him. They would question one of her ex-boyfriends, but they were quickly able to rule him out. Then police caught a break. They had been doing some digging and Sue had hired some people to come into her home six months prior to clean out the air conditioning ducts. One of those men was Jeffrey Heffling. Jeffrey had a criminal past. In 1980, he had sexually assaulted and kidnapped a woman at gunpoint. The company he worked for, I believe was called Burdines. They never ran a background check on any of their employees. They never knew of his past. And they sent this man to many people's homes, including vulnerable people who lived alone. They were able to obtain a sample of his DNA because DNA was left inside Sue. The DNA matched. It was his. In 2004, he took a plea deal and was sentenced to life without parole. And Kathy's family won a lawsuit against the company and won $9 million. This is a moment captured on CCTV of a predator stalking his prey. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Libby Squire. Viewer discretion is advised. Libby was born in 1998 in Buckinghamshire, England. By 2019, she was a student at the University of Hull. Her family said that at the time, Libby was in the best place in her life. Everything was going perfectly for her and she was on track for huge successes. Libby, like many 21-year-olds, also loved to go out and have fun. And on the evening of the 31st of January 2019, she was doing just that. She was out and about with friends. Now, she had been drinking a lot because, again, she was just out having fun and she was fairly intoxicated. At approximately 11.20 p.m. that night, she is spotted on CCTV outside of a nightclub called The Welly. Now, the bouncer there refused to let Libby in because it appeared to him that she had been too intoxicated. So she was refused entry, and then her friends came out and got her a cab. So at 11.29, she had been dropped off at her home, but she never entered. Approximately 11 minutes later, she is seen by witnesses around Beverly Road walking. And then Libby would never be seen alive again. Her family would soon report her missing after they realized she never got home. So then police began combing through the CCTV footage in the area. And while they're doing that, they also have search teams out searching everywhere. They are digging through brush. They are searching the nearby waters. But at that time, they never find anything. Now, tracking Libby's walking movements through camera, they do pick her up walking down this road. And they also were tracking another person who was walking down the other side of the road who appeared to be stalking Libby. And then that individual is seen right next to her. Police have been looking through footage and they saw this individual in a car. As a matter of fact, this is him outside of his car waiting for someone. Police were then able to determine, apparently through this image and others, that Libby entered the car as well. They don't know if it was by force or if the person convinced her to get in. Who was this person? 26-year-old Pavel Relevich, a man originally from Poland and a man who had a history of being a peeping Tom, voyeurism. He burglarized the home of women and stole their underwear. So police brought him in for questioning. He said, yeah, I picked up Libby that night. We had consensual sex and I let her go. Well, unfortunately, they found Libby's body floating in a river two months later. Her body was so badly decomposed, they could not even tell her cause of death. Now, because she had been in the water for so long, there was almost no trace evidence, but they did find some male DNA inside of her. That DNA would match Pavel Relevich. But again, he already said that he had consensual sex with her, so that would, I guess, make sense. At one point, people even tried to speculate that maybe she fell into the water on her own or she did it on purpose after her encounter with Pavel. 
except they did find some blunt force trauma around her mouth. Almost as if someone was pressing their palm against her mouth very firmly. And that would be enough evidence to press charges against the man. So they would go to trial where he would be convicted of the murder of Limby Squire. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 27 years. He tried to appeal that sentence by saying it was too strict. Really? It's not strict enough in my opinion. But he was denied anyway, so. His sentence stands. He stalked Libby, sexually assaulted her, and ended her life. And for what? In just a nine minute window of time, a young teenage girl would go missing forever. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Sierra Lamar. Viewer discretion is advised. Sierra was a 15 year old high school girl who had recently moved from Fremont, California to Morgan Hill also in California. Sierra was described by many as a happy-go-lucky, vivacious cheerleader, someone with a lot of energy, a lot of, you know, pep in her step. Every school morning would begin the same. She would wake up, have breakfast, and by 7.15 a.m. she would leave her house, and then the bus would pick her up at approximately 7.24 a.m. And by all accounts, nothing was different on March 16th, 2012. She had even sent a text to her friend to make plans for when they got to school that morning. But Sierra never got to school. As a matter of fact, she never got on the bus. They knew for sure that she left at 7.15 like she always did. So what happened between 7.15 and 7.24? When Sierra's mom got home, she was fully expecting Sierra to be there, but she wasn't. And this is when she found out that Sierra never went to school. So she reported her daughter missing. By checking her phone history, they confirmed that at 7.11 in the morning, she sent a text to her friend and that she would always be at the bus stop by 7.24. So a search began and they began to comb everywhere. The cell phone was found less than a mile away from her home in a field. Six days after she disappeared, they found some more items in a shed. Her purse, her school books, and her clothing. Her clothes were covered in dirt, it appeared that she had likely been dragged, but Sierra was nowhere. There was, however, DNA on her clothing. DNA that was not hers. When they ran the DNA through the system, it matched this man. Antolin Garcia Torres. Something else that connected him to Sierra was his red Toyota vehicle. You see, CCTV cameras picked up a red Toyota vehicle driving in the exact same area that Sierra disappeared, and it had a black hood and that car belonged to Mr. Torres. They found rope in the trunk, and on the rope, they found a strand of hair. That strand of hair was confirmed to be Sierra Lamar's. His DNA on her clothing, her DNA found in his trunk. So he was arrested and charged with her kidnapping and murder, even though there was no body. And as a matter of fact, to this very day, they still have not found her body. His defense would claim that she just ran away, Yet she took absolutely nothing with her and she told no one. And no teenager is going to just throw their phone in a field. The case was strongly circumstantial, yes. But he was still convicted and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. They could have given him the death penalty, but the jury could not agree on it. But where is Sierra? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Adriana Marines. Viewer discretion is advised. Adriana lived in Corpus Christi, Texas with her family, her father Arturo and her mother Matilda. At one point, her uncle Ted Quaylar lived there at the house with them, but one week prior to this story taking place, he had moved out. Unfortunately, by the way, folks, I, I have no pictures really of this case. I have two very grainy photos, one of the victim and one of one of the killers. This case appeared to have virtually no publicity. A day or so prior to September 27, 1997, the uncle, Ted Quaylar, apparently had hit his girlfriend. He had struck her during an argument. The girlfriend's son, John Baltazar, would find out. And this was on September 27, 1997. 
He had already started getting drunk earlier in the morning that day, and he just kept drinking throughout the day. All the while, his anger building and building and building towards the man who beat his mother. And he finally decided, I'm going to go take care of this. So, he got one of his friends, Johnny Gonzalez, whose photo I cannot find, and the two of them, now armed with a gun, would get in the car and drive to the house they thought Mr. Quaylar was living in. They did not know that Ted Quaylar moved out a week prior. The two men would approach the front door of the house and violently beat the door down. Inside the house, it was pitch dark, with the exception of the TV in the living room, which was playing Sleeping Beauty. Now, John knew that Ted Quaylar slept on the couch in this house, so he just assumed that was who was laying there. He took out his gun, and he fired blindly towards the couch. Arturo heard the shots, and he began running towards the living room. He then was shot. When the dust had cleared, five-year-old Adriana had two bullet holes in her head, and she died instantly. Lying next to her on the couch was her 10-year-old niece, Vanessa, who was over watching a movie. She had gotten shot in the chest. Thankfully, she survived. Arturo would also survive his wounds. John Baltazar and Johnny Gonzalez would both be arrested. Baltazar would say, I did not know that they were laying on the couch. I never would have shot them if I knew there was a little girl there. But then he says, I don't regret shooting the father. Quite honestly, he just didn't show much remorse for what he did. Well, sucks to be him. He was convicted of Adriana's murder, and he was sentenced to death. In 2003, he was executed by lethal injection. Johnny Gonzalez was sentenced to 80 years in prison with the possibility of parole, and to my knowledge, he is still in prison. Imagine ending a person's life because of a time card. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michelle Mockby. Viewer discretion is advised. 42-year-old Michelle Mockby worked in Florence, Kentucky, here at the Thermo Fisher Scientific Building. By 2012, she had worked there for 16 years, and at the time of this case, she was working in the HR department. At some point during her tenure at the company, she met and married a man by the name of Dan Mockby. By all accounts, they were a very happy couple. They had two beautiful daughters, and they just loved spending time together as a family. Michelle was always considered like a positive light at work. You know, someone who just made sure everything was going smoothly, everyone was happy. In the early morning hours of May 29th, 2012, Michelle was caught on CCTV camera entering her work building at 5.53 a.m. Within an hour of her getting to work, her badly beaten and bloodied body was found in the building. She was found on the second floor mezzanine, lying face down, sprawled out, and just blood everywhere. It would eventually be determined that Michelle had four very severe uh, blunt force trauma injuries to her head. She had a plastic bag tied around her head, and her arms and legs were bound. This just came as like an absolute shock to everyone. The very first person that police looked at was her husband, Dan, since they did work together in that building. But it was confirmed that Dan was at home asleep at the time of this murder. Police would find that her office was in slight disarray, as if someone had been looking through things. They found a shoe impression, which did not match her husband, and her office door had been pried open. Further looks into the CCTV footage would show this man, David Dooley, who was the janitor for the building. He left the building sometime around 6.30 a.m. and then he came back. His wife also worked in the building. She was home that morning and she said that he came home and changed his pants and then went back to work. His shoe prints matched this one. Police would dig further into David and his wife. They would uncover the fact that the two of them were falsifying their time cards. The couple was clocking in and out when they weren't there at all. Michelle worked in the HR department. Her office would have those time cards. It's believed that he broke into her office with the intent of stealing those time cards, and she happened to walk in as he was doing that. So David was arrested and charged with her murder. And due to mainly circumstantial evidence, 
David Dooley was convicted of her murder. He would end up getting 43 years in prison.